Adila, we're ready when you are. Okay, I'm ready. Great. November 7th, 2022 Curriculum and Policy Committee meeting um, at 4.34 p.m. Roll call, Lindsay Ryan. Here. Ola Simbo. Here. You can go ahead and read the land acknowledgement. Okay. So we take time to acknowledge that the land we meet on is the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Potawatomi, the Ojibwe, and Ottawa. This land also serves as an important meeting place for Miami, Ho-Chunk, uh, Menominee, Inoka, Sac, Fox, Peoria, Arapaho, Cheyenne, and other tribal nations. This land has long been a center for indigenous people to gather, trade, and maintain kinship ties. Located at the intersection of several great waterways, the region has become the site of travel and prosperity. We acknowledge Evanston and John Evans are tied to the massacre of the Arapaho and Cheyenne for railroads and westward expansion upon which John Evans developed his wealth and founded Evanston. This land was violently taken under settler colonialism through genocide and open warfare in the region that is now, no, is now Illinois and Chicagoland is still home to thousands of native people who are actively struggling for sovereignty, self-determination, and justice. The genocidal acts of settler colonialism extended to peoples of Africa and their enslaved descendants. Despite Illinois eventually prohibiting slavery, slavery was an accepted practice before and after statehood. The vestiges of slavery remain present throughout the United States and directly affect the descendants of enslaved peoples, descendants who helped define the African diaspora, rich and heterogeneous communities descended from African peoples. The genocidal patterns of violence against peoples of African descent and indigenous people have been replicated to exclude and harm people from many intersecting marginalized identities, religious, minoritized, disabled, LGBTQ identified peoples, BIPOC and POC writ large in the United States. These patterns of violence demonstrate that the pursuit to end state-sanctioned violence against BIPOC is a daily struggle for liberation from continued social, political, and economic anti-black racism and oppression. Today we acknowledge that we are living, breathing, loving, grieving, laughing, and sharing space on unceded territory. On unceded territory. May we learn to honor the historical and contemporary presence and power of the people and their belief that we must be caretakers of the lands and waters for the livelihood of future generations. The land that surrounds us is part of who we are and reflects our history. It is within District 65's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about black and indigenous peoples and marginalized peoples writ large, consistent with our commitment to equity. We will work towards sharing truth and promoting healing for the sake of our children and families. It is important to understand the long-standing history that has brought us to reside on the land and to, seek and to seek to understand our place within that history. Land acknowledgments do not exist in the past tense or only in the historic context. Colonialism is a current, ongoing process, and we need to understand our present participation. We encourage everyone consuming this message to continue expanding their knowledge and reduce their harm through awareness of local mutual aid models for survival and engagement with online and local resources such as the Chicago American Indian Community Collaborative and the Shorefront Legacy Center. Thank you. All right. Uh, approval of the meeting agenda. I move to approve an amended agenda for today's meeting. Agenda item number six, educational efforts for, and science, will be postponed to the November 14th board meeting. Second. Lindsay Ryan? Yes. Hernandez? Yes. Yes. 
All right, public comments. Uh, members of the public are welcome and invited to address the Curriculum and Policy Committee during open public meetings. Speakers are discouraged from using the public comment period to air specific concerns about staff members being mindful that the public comment period is not a suitable forum for fact-finding or resolution of disputes. Rather, we encourage members of the public who have concerns about specific district employees to follow district communication guidelines found in the student handbook. Please remember to state your name and that you have three minutes to address the committee. Also note that it is not customary the, for the committee to respond to public comments. The best way to correspond with members is by emailing schoolboard at district65.net. Adila, do we have any public comments? No, we do not have anyone signed up. All right. Um, approval of the Curriculum and Policy Committee meeting minutes. Uh, if there are no amendments, I move to approve the October 2022 Curriculum and Policy Committee meeting minutes. Second. Second. Olisimbo? Yes. Uh, Hernandez? Yes. Lindsay Ryan? Yes. All right, and we're going to move on to the curriculum uh, review packet. Um, we uh, generally have questions that we've gathered for various folks. So, Tracy, if you have any questions for anybody about your section of the packet, go for it. Um, okay, so there was a lot of great information in there, so I'm super excited about all the great work that you all are doing. I just have um, a couple of questions. Uh, my first one was about the a professional learning department newsletter. And I know in some of the data we saw that some of our professional development had to be canceled because of low registration. So I just wanted to know if there was any data around how staff have been, have been engaging with the newsletter, opens, clicks, sign-ups from the newsletter, anything like that. Howdy. I'm Jamila Pitts, Director of Professional Learning. Good to see you. Uh, Dr. Turner forwarded that question to me. We sent out our professional learning newsletter via uh, Canva. That particular platform does not count the number of clicks that we get, but I often get emails back from people or people stop me in the hallway and say thank you so much, so people are, are receiving it. The directors monitor who is signing up for their sessions, and we did have one science session that did need to be canceled because there was an outside vendor that we were having, so we made an agreement that if we don't have sufficient enrollment, we obviously don't want to pay a vendor for uh, a small uh, number of people. Thank you. Any questions? You can keep going. Right there. Um, I was curious to know a little bit about um, moving on to another topic, I guess, for DESA and uh, the social emotional learning and data tracking um, or collection. Um, what do some of the interventions look like for students that fall into the needs instruction category? Sorry. Um, so I was just saying for, um, I just was curious to know what do the interventions look like for the students that fall into the need instruction category? What does that look like for those kids? Good question. So this is our first, our first time with DESA. Um, so getting this data has been uh, very interesting. Um, a little over 90% of our students are actually coming up in that like typical in strength, which is higher than even expected. Um, so for the students that are coming in the needs instruction category, um, some of the resources that we do have available, some are uh, a lot in our Branching Minds cat, um, library, which is available in our MTSS tool. Uh, we also have the SEL roadmap um, and SEL toolkits. Uh, we've had some summer work with our counselors and social workers who developed some uh, lessons and resources for middle school. Um, but this is still, this is ongoing work that has to be done collectively through multiple departments. So culture and climate, SEL, um, IES, um, and then also Kirby with the, with the counselors. Um, that's, that's just this lift this year and it's gonna continue to have to work so that we can have that nice uh, kind of, I guess, matrix for educators to have just lessons, resources, strategies to use uh, based on those like DESA sub scores. Um, so we're in the preliminary part of that right now, um, and there's still just a lot of work to be done. Um, and being able to have the, the DESA data this year for the first time um, is really helpful because we had no idea what, this, what that was going to look like until we did it. So now we have that. Um, so it gives us a, a little bit more of a pathway of like where do we need to focus. Um, so that's ongoing work. Um, that it's going to it's a big lift. It's a big lift. Yeah. Do you have Thank you. Sweet. 
That was the only question I had about the DESA data. Okay. Um, I can, we can yeah. go back and forth if yeah. you want to break. Um, I, I don't think I have any additional questions for either of you. I apologize if something I ask requires you. Um, Dr. Turner, um, oh, sorry, did you have, yeah, I was like, you guys are good. Thank you. Um, uh, I, as I have uh, shared in previous meetings, I'm very excited about the relationship work you've been doing. Um, and I'm wondering what kind of indicators you might be using to evaluate whether relationships are improving or not. Certainly one that I'm seeing on the board level is the amount of emails we're getting about situations that should be managed on the building level or at your level have significantly decreased. So that's a good indicator to me that relationships are improving and I'm excited to, to see that that like it, it seems like more things are getting handled in the proper chain of command but I want to know kind of how you felt things were going and if there were other indicators that you're looking at to say okay no we, we really feel like we are making progress here or we won't feel like we are making it until we reach this point. Yeah that's a good question and, and, and thanks for asking that Biz. I'll be quite honest with you I'm actually quite happy and impressed with the improvements that we're making around relationships. If you ask me what, do, what would I attribute that to, I attribute it to the reset that we set and we were very clear with, with school leaders this year around the importance of going in to really build collaborative relationships with all stakeholders, starting with your deck reps, starting with your SIT teams, filtering out into your families and communities. And so, um, in terms of indicators, so one of the documents that we, um, we, we keep an internal document that we specifically call the elementary and middle school parent guardian communication log. And so we use that as one of our indicators to really indicate. And so basically what, that, what happens with that log, that log filters all of the complaints or concerns that go straight to um, the superintendent's office. Maria then fills out that and then she notifies us of any concerns. And so we have a very systematic process we do for that. I think I talked about before how of the 15 schools that Lydia and I directly oversee, we split the caseload of who supports what school. So based off of that particular log, we have five complaints that have come in from um, well, actually six from the beginning of the school year, like August all the way to October. Um, one complaint was from Lincoln, situation that happened the first day of school. Second complaint was from Betsy Rose. And then the rest of the complaints pretty much were concerns or complaints from Nichols. And so because those schools fall specifically under Lydia, what she then does is she works alongside Elijah and then we triage to determine who, how, what that level of support looks like. We first start in full transparency at the school level because what we're trying to help people to understand is that the school leaders are the first point of contact to resolving problems and we're trying to reset behavior in terms of the automatic, you go straight to the district office and you kind of, or go straight to the board and you filter those complaints, right? So starting at the school level. Typically at the school level, if issues can't get resolved, then that's when um, either Lydia or I get involved with the school leaders. We pull in Elijah. He has his direct reports, which are the culture and climate folks, and then we work to determine what are the SEL needs of students, or if students are out for whatever reason, how do we have a re-entry conversation and reset with clear expectations moving forward? And I have to, I have to honestly say that has been working really well in full transparency. We, we may every so often have some tougher, more challenging situations. And when that happens, then we collaborate with, with our colleagues, specifically with Dr. Romy's team, um, either with her, with Anna Marie, or any of the IES coordinators. And so then we collectively meet as a school team. Either myself comes, typically Palmer, so it's a full house with the school, um, with the principal, with the families and we get to the root cause of what the problem is and then we try to work through with a very structured either behavior plan or support plan for that particular student or that family. And so that has just been our process. We're very hands-on, we're very involved, but we do have a very structured system that says you start at the school level with the school at men and if they can't work through the problem, then either they lift it up for us for additional support, or, or typically the parent will lift it up for additional support as well. Well, you know, and there are times where things do need to come to the board level. I'm not at all suggesting that that shouldn't uh, be an outlet for folks, but um, I've been really 
impressed with your team. There, there's clearly clarity in process and uh, clarity and support that people do not feel like they need to be bringing every concern um, up, to, up to up the flagpole. So uh, whatever whatever you're doing, <laughs> okay. keep it up. Please let your team know that you know it sounds like there's more things being handled on the building level, and that and that the folks feel like they have the support they need to handle those things. Um, but you know, I think as we continue. So we just want to see those relationships get better and better and better. So continuing to think of what what indicators we're looking at that says, you know, sometimes it's like when we're doing equity work, right? Sometimes it's it's not. There's no problems. It's like no, there's a really big problem that actually people brought forward right. that they wouldn't have brought forward before. So it might feel more stressful right now, but it's because we're dealing with the real and we're addressing things. So it, it may not even always be positive indicators. It might be there's some negative stuff coming forward, but it's coming forward yeah, and, sure. we're, and we're addressing sure. and I, it. I want to add to our, our we have um, some collaborative partners that we're partnering with. So we partner with. Um, with Maria and, and her team in the deck exec very heavily. And so Lydia and I have um, a regular meeting in terms with her so she can bring any issues that might be arising. And then we then work collect collectively together to figure out how to resolve those, whether there's something that she needs to go back and help to make sense of with her members or specifically something that we need to do on the school team, school's team side to work with school leaders. And then we have other additional partners. We have supporting educators that come and they're working with our first year principals. We have Mosaic that we're also partnering with to work with some of the um, more uh, nurturing the whole child as well as some of the DEIB work. And so it's, it's a collective effort from all of us though, but I, I would argue it's very intentional targeted support that we're providing. Um, that we're holding ourselves accountable to, and then we're holding our, our school leaders accountable to providing that level of support for, for the families at their schools. Terrific. Just wanted to ask uh, some questions that our colleague Sula uh, submitted. Um, and, and, and it's interesting how we're talking about um, you know, just some of the social emotional piece, the um, the supports that we have around relationship building that Dr. Turner and her team have undertaken. Uh, so then this goes into some of the framework that we're utilizing to align um, all of our academic outcome work. Uh, and again, I know we'll, we're going to hear some really great data um, and, and just uh, some interesting data as the meeting progresses, but this is a question for Dr. Green and, 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 and Dr. Beardsley around just, you know, for the public, just, get, you, know, you know, there's three mechanisms that we're utilizing to, you know, to set up the framework and the alignment for educators and for, uh, for our buildings, right? One of them is our reality checks. The next is our collaborative cal calibration visits and then our learning walks, right? So if you, if y'all can maybe explain for the public just the kind of help us uh, 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 um, kind of set, set the table, right, as, as we move into uh, aligning all our academic outcome work. I'll start with um, just describing a little bit in relation to the reality checks. We know that we started that um, last year. Two years ago. Two years ago. Um, it really just provides us an opportunity as district and school level team to really um, analyze it and really brainstorm around next steps from what the data provides us with. we like to be in that same conversation, making some uh, determinations about the story that's being told, but also thinking about what adjustments and next steps. And because we do that traditionally three times a year, following our assessment windows, we can kind of do it in real time in a more frequent manner. So that's where our reality checks come from. The CCB is kind of a complement to that, right? So um, if the data tells a story just from the quantitative aspect, the CCB provides a little bit more of qualitative aspect of what goes on in our schools. And we know that the six systems is kind of the blueprint that our school leaders are given in terms of like what are those strong instructional practices that are um, best practices but specifically have uh, been proven in, in a, many of our experiences to be very uh, beneficial for our targeted student groups who may not be experienced in school to the fullest expectation that we all have. Um, and so the CCB is a group of district administrators, each representing um, an area of expertise and specialty. And we kind of go in with a lens based on the self-assessment that a school team does. And so therein lies the calibration aspect. Here's where you think you are, you provide some evidence. We look at that evidence and we concur with you or we make recommendations. So it's a 90 minute process. We are um, in the last week of this first round, everybody's like, breathing aside, release, but um, 
it's really just fascinating to see the ways that our school leaders and school teams, the ingenuity that they have coming up with how to implement. So that expresses um, the, the two things that have kind of been in place, and, and, and I, you'll hear me say this again later in the uh, data portion of the uh, strat plan update, that it's just so exciting to see the pieces come together because we started certain things kind of in isolation, and then Stacy and her team have really rounded out with a really nice look to complement when we were doing our CMSI audit where we had a third party come in and give us some advice. Well, now they spent time getting trained and they're looking at some things along some cornerstones for their work. And so again, all of this is information so that we're not flying blind and we're not going off of isolated events, but we're creating that triangle of disaggregating, our, I'm sorry, of triangulating our data for some really important storytelling. Um, so the learning walk is really just, uh, then from there, kind of a deep dive into the actual instruction in your classrooms. And it's a collaborative effort where we co connect with the school leader and their leadership team and say, hey, which focus area do you want feedback on based on us walking classrooms together? Um, we set up a process that we kind of do the upfront training together in the morning. We go in, we visit classrooms, we describe the practice that we see, we then are moving from there into kind of general analysis and prediction about the impact that the teaching and learning that we're seeing in the classrooms would have on student outcomes within that school. And I think the real, um, we're now, we have our fourth one coming up. Um, the, what we're hearing back is one, it's very collective and collaborative. We are doing this with the school teams. We have at least four members from the school that join four to six folks from CNI, and we do this together as a team to serve as trends and patterns and instruction and give them some feedback that can get used to inform how to drive their school improvement plan forward. And the last piece of this is, this is a valuable process for ongoing learning. So some of our schools are also using this to then think about and inform how they might want to do that within their school in an ongoing way with educators. And so I do think that's one of the exciting parts is that they've been including teachers within this process so that schools can think about, is this something that we can use and bring value to drive our own improvement? Thank you, for, thank you for the explanation and again, setting the table. So again, what we're gonna hear is some of the data, but again, we've got, we've got the structures in place to triangulate that data, like you said, Dr. Green, uh, and then act on it, right? To ensure that we start closing any gaps that are out there and then really meeting our educators, our buildings, our leaders where they're at uh, and, and, and collaborating with them in order to try to close those gaps. Uh, whereas, again, common practice in American education is that, again, we leave buildings to themselves uh, and then we make decisions at central office, uh, and then building leaders are surprised, okay, well, how am I supposed to implement this? Here you're taking this collaborative uh, and very deliberate intentional approach to embed equity uh, in, in, into instructional practices that are gonna help us close the gaps through, again, running the equity, one, running the, the data through, through an equity lens, but also having an actual plan uh, that, that takes collaboration from central office, from building, from building leaders, and from our educators, and some input from our families as well, I imagine. So thank you for sharing that. Is there someone who can answer culture and climate questions? I don't see Elijah in there. Great, sorry to pull you back up. <laughs> I apologize, I could have asked these questions when you were up here, I was thinking. I should have noticed that I didn't see Elijah over everyone else's heads and that he wasn't in the room. All right, um, so I saw that there was a presentation at Nichols around bullying and I, was, I had a couple of questions about that in terms of whether we have plans to have that at other middle schools, um, but also wondering if we've thought about having some targeted presentations. I think there are ways that um, kids in, in marginalized groups are particularly getting bullied or maybe doesn't meet our definition of bullying, but are getting mistreated or experiencing unkindness. And could we think about doing a presentation that was maybe affinity group based, right? Maybe it's the parents and families of LGBT kids come together for something, or if, there's, if, there's, if we're seeing high incidents around non-native uh, English speakers, right? Having a, what, I don't know exactly what, we'd have to look at the data to see what groups most might benefit from that. But um, I think it's probably a little different than the general conversation around bullying. Um, and so I was just curious whether we had 
considered that or whether that was something we could pursue. I could speak to that probably better than Mr. Bronson. He's been in two weeks. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, there are some plans uh, with, uh, with Mr. Palmer to provide some specific supports for our, for our unique populations, but especially at the middle school. We also have um, Dr. Lockhart, who's been trained by the state, uh, if I'm not mistaken, for the affinity train for the affinity work. So we have yet to fully launch that, but is uh, we ISBE actually has a whole cohort of um, educators across the state that they've trained. And so we've, uh, we sent Dr. Lockhart and we soon will be launching some support through that work with, with her and training individuals and even hosting affinity groups at the specific Yeah, schools. I think that intersection around bullying and affinity space might be something we, we would want want to talk about. And I think even helping folks identify like what is the kind of meets the definition of bullying and what is like people are experiencing hostility or discomfort or unkind words or whatever else and, and helping those families identify strategies and understanding what the right um, methods of support are within the institution. Because I think and particularly in our middle schools, I think there's pretty high incident of uh, people being targeted for who they are. And so if we can you know, think about bringing families together around those issues that might help. And our VAS bullying training also has other levels to that. Uh, of course, if Mr. If Mr. Palmer was here, he could speak more detail, but we actually have some things that we have not launched through the OVAS that, that will land to some of the things that you're mentioning right now. Yeah, yeah I, I just, I, you know, I think um, certainly as a, as a parent of three middle schoolers, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of behavior that we um, want to help parents and caregivers navigate with their with their kids and give kids tools on. Um, this is a totally different question, but I, I'm guessing, Donna, you might have a response to it. So thinking about branching minds um, and the data that we're seeing there, we obviously continue to see pretty significant racial disparity in our discipline. Um, so thinking about how we can use that data to identify maybe educators that are over-identifying students or need additional support and tools for classroom management or whatever else so that they aren't using that intervention in a way that isn't consistent with the, um, the population's needs or aren't targeting uh, students because of bias or other pieces. So we, have we gotten to that level of the data of branching minds yet? Okay. What does that look like? So, uh, great, yeah, you read some stuff down today. We met today. Um, okay, great. Can you hear me? Okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Donna, maybe pull it closer because we can hear you, but I don't know if the people who are trying to watch it not here can hear you. Thank you. Sure, you want to give me an amp? Um, so, we, we, we were able to look at the data, but we, we can disaggregate all the way down to, you know, like, like by teacher yeah. and things like that. Um, one thing we did notice is like the disproportionality, which the question came up here, again, especially with our, with our black boys and black girls. Um, so when we just dug into just that particular area, we were looking at the level, so level one and level two, which are classroom managed behaviors, uh, was 73% of our behavior issues. So everything that you're mentioning about, um, you know, that adult SEL piece and supporting educators and building leaders and one, like, you can easily identify where like visually, what grade level, what time of day. We were looking at like kindergarten and two and 3 p.m. I was like, well, I bet you that's when fine arts is. Like you can identify that and all, of, all the way down to like the teacher, down to the student. So if you're seeing an educator with um, a lot of those level one, level twos, especially when it's the same student, like from a building leader lens, how are we going in and supporting that educator and also providing um, the support, the professional learning, um, and the resources for that tier one, like classroom management, because um, if it's level one, level two, that's that's where it's happening. Yeah, that's the expectation. Management. So we want to have accountability. Is there, um, does our system flag people in a way that makes that easier for principals, or do you have to go and get into the data and really find out that oh, of of the, you know, 25 uh, situations that happened, nine of them were from one teacher, right? Like how do, how easy is that to find? so that we can then make sure that teacher has the tools they need to be successful. So it's it's pretty easy to find. It's not like a flag, though. Okay. So you do have to go in looking at that particular information. From a district-wide standpoint, that's a huge thing. But as I narrow it down by school, it makes it it's, it's as simple as, like, clicking a filter. Okay. Um, 
And I would just like to add, what you're, the, what you're asking is exactly the model that we used last year when we had the situations at Haven. Uh, and we were and some of the shifts that we made around culture and climate this year came from, uh, from us looking at that data specific uh, around uh, when students were having these infractions, if there were certain teachers that were having trouble, and we put some, some additional supports in place. So yes, we could definitely leverage that. Yeah, and there are times where classroom placement doesn't work very well, right? And that one teacher has more kids who have more needs than anticipated, or, you know, those kids that we didn't know had needs. And, and so there are times where it's, you know, it's, I don't suggest this just to be punitive for educators, right? Like that might be that we're like, we have to really make sure that they have a better balance in, in the classrooms that they're getting, because, you know, if, if one class has zero and another class has nine, it doesn't necessarily mean that one teacher is using the system well and one is not. Um, but, but being able to kind of dig in and, and have the, the level of depth of assessment so that we can say, okay, this seems to be really heavy from this, this educator or from this grade. Is there something that we need to do pedagogically or f around the philosophy or reverse sort of practice, right? Like what, what are we missing? Is this someone who just became a new person in our district and hasn't been fully onboarded into how things work? Is this a veteran teacher who maybe hasn't, hasn't changed practice with some of the things that we've expected over the year, right? Like being able to unpack it further and making sure that our principals have the tools for that kind of analysis. Absolutely, and one thing that's been really helpful that I just have to like shout out our educators is over the years as we've started to use this more and more um, is really how detailed the description is yeah. um, because numbers are one thing but when you're able to actually look and see like we looked at one particular student and all of his we were able to see patterns you know obviously in the visual but even just reading the descriptions and how well they were done it's like okay i know exactly what happened this right. teacher told me exactly what happened and so that's helpful and from both our lens and from the, the principal lens um, to be able to provide that, that exact, because there's an exact need there. And there's pattern finding. Like we noticed for this one particular student we were looking at, it's during transition time. Right. So they're transitioning between this and this, or they're moving. Which might be related to our previous discussion, right? If a kid is getting targeted and harassed in the hallway or at, you know, in the less structured time of, of recess or whatever, and then that class afterwards is when they are having yeah. challenges all the time, that's a different solution yeah. than what we might be doing with the student. Yeah, the one we're, the one we're yeah. looking at today was actually transitions within the classroom. Yeah, okay, interesting. You know? So like that's like, okay, we're able to identify that and we can put some quick strategies in place for where like, all right, you're gonna transition after the rest of the class or I'm gonna prep you before the transition and use that reminding language. Like, can you remind me what we're doing during this yeah. transition? What are the two things I need you to do? You've got a minute to do it, let's go. Um, but again, that, that does take um, like some professional learning there. It does take our time of like, we, we have to identify what these patterns and trends are so that we can provide the right support. Yeah, and that might be the next piece of this, right? And, and I said a flag in the system, but something that like, I don't expect every principal to be able to ha to have the time to go in and do a full analysis of all of the, every single thing in branching minds, right? So what are we doing as a system to make that as easy as possible so that certain themes are being identified Absolutely. easily? Okay, anybody else have questions on branching minds or climate? All right, I, th I really do think we're done asking you questions, but I, I, I can't promise. Thank you very much. Do you have additional questions? Um, you can go through. Uh, Andalib, can I ask you some questions about guest educators? Thank you. Well, you, you can tell me what you're going to for. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions that you probably don't have the answer to, and it's okay. Duly noted. <laughs> So, you know, for those, for those who haven't been following it as closely as those of us in this room, um, we, we took over the guest educator program, so we don't have a separate contractor that we use for substitutes. We now have the whole system in-house, which solves a lot of different uh, challenges and, and certainly saves us a lot of money and, and hopefully gives us more chance to have better ownership over that substitute process. So. Um, I was curious, like now that we're a couple months in, like how is the fill rate comparing to previous years? And then also, you know, because this is a massive transition, would you say we're like 10% in the transition, 25% in the transition? Like when do we think we, you know, we'd reap all of the benefits of what we're hoping to accomplish with this change? And there's no consequence for your answer. I'm just curious. 
No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so a couple of things, well, um, and I appreciate the latitude involved, but I will say that, number one, um, we've completed the hiring for our team, so now we're up to three people finally. Um, that ended about a three weeks ago, so that's that's progress. We actually, somebody internally changed departments to join that team, so that's number one. Number two, the fill rate, um, we are still getting clarity about those because when what's reported includes a lot of, let's call it, you have mixed numbers in there, right? So you may people have leave of absences, um, paraprofessionals, and so in terms of our teacher fill rate versus our general fill rate, it's still being discerned. And so looking at last year's versus this year's, I haven't got a full report yet, but I will say that um, next month for the December one, we can have a more clear number that represents exactly what it is. Um, I would say that uh, sorry, we're at 50. I, I'm not trying to give you busy work, so no, if that's no, no, not no, something no. we're creating, we need it. Otherwise, okay. No, I, I was like, no, it I, have to go on my why, timeline. I just want to no, make sure. Because substantively, it's a lot of effort, so we do need those numbers. So it's okay. not a, it's not a busy work. It's actually an important part of the work we need to do is to see what are we reaping from this additional right. effort internally. There are other companies, ESS was one, we brought this in-house, do we keep this one? Now, I, I want to say that the team is working very hard. Um, we have experienced some, you could say, transitional bumps in terms of our software. Uh, we adopted Frontline, which is a product we've been using, and so um, there have been some natural bumps in terms of migration of that data back to us. Um, from ESS, so Frontline is one company, ESS is another company. That software um, that we've used was owned by ESS. This now, feels familiar. We had this with a different company previously, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. sorry. It's what? Power School. When we switched to Power School, there was like yeah. getting, getting data from <clears throat> whoever. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Right. So we actually are learning about working with that company. Um, I actually met with the vice president of their customer relations last week because we had a big migration issue that had a huge impact on all of our staff district-wide. Um, that had nothing to do with our error. It was an error of that company. Um, and so we actually met with them to improve our ability to get customer support. So um, I, I want to say that we are 50% in. Uh, we have our effort to hire. You've heard those numbers. We are continuing to recruit actively, number one. Number two, we have a strong, what do you call it, uh, we're not losing subs, um, the, the level of complaint. Um, I know that Ashley, our manager for temporary staffing, has a very good relationship with principals. Um, she is in, we're able to staff and get regular communication back when we have absences that are happening in schools. Is it, is it we have a ways to go, I would say, in terms of filling the amount needed because there are schools where we have to do emergency subbing, where teachers have to step in. We do know that there are still challenges out there and we're working to accommodate those. Um, this is completely random, but I'm just remembering it now. Apparently when, the, when a call comes through to a potential guest educator, it doesn't come through as being from the district. Is that something we can change, right? So if I'm looking at my phone and it just has some random phone number at 6 a.m., mm -hmm. I may not answer it because I may not be thinking, oh, right, this could be a call about sub. Is there a way for that number to be, this is District 65 calling you? Is that a guest educator who's getting that call? The guest educator shared with me that they had they had oh, um, declined yeah. the call a few times before they figured out <laughs> what it was. Oh, yeah. Um, and so if there's any way to make that more visibly us, that might Absolutely. Be I can look into that. Okay. I'm actually pretty excited to hear your 50% in. That's a, it's a big undertaking. Yeah, no, I, I would say they, they've worked really hard. The coordination and uh, the branding, we're getting ready to do a virtual fair on the 19th, so this is public, so I will share that on 19th, uh, live uh, fair for paraprofessionals here at the JH building. So that announcement will be going out today or tomorrow, uh, recruiting our paraprofessionals. That's where a lot of our uh, staffing needs are. Great, and then I think this actually could, oh, were you gonna ask the Sula question? Because I, I was gonna, um, I think this kind of connects to one of the questions Sula had was about technology, right? We seem to have a lot of different great technological resources for our staff, but I'm uh, concerned of like, are they having to log into 400 different systems all day? Like, is there a way to have that be more streamlined so that people are, are logged into fewer systems or one system that gets access to all of those things? It's, I know it's a tech question, not an HR question, so if you... I, I can start by saying, and then, you know, I think um, 
we can speak to, like what are the products? One thing I will say is that we've moved to one password that has helped like streamline. I love one password. I, we all had to go through the training. It was like pulling teeth. I know that tech did a really, took on that big project to get everybody involved. I personally will say that it has made life a lot easier. And so I hope um, if anybody's not using one password, we should be using one password and it really cuts down on the challenges of multiple systems because you can just access that one password. Um, I think in terms of the other one, I, I don't know if uh, I, I would hold on speaking to it in terms of the analysis of that because I think that that's something that I want Joe and um, that team to speak more directly to. Okay. That just might, you know, we, we want our educators to have every tool imaginable. Uh, we don't want them to have to spend 42 minutes a day getting into all the tools. So, any additional questions for Andalee? Thank you, Andalee. Thank you. I think the only other thing I wanted to mention about this uh, this report was uh, really exciting from Dr. Osher's saying that we had 125 people that were interested in getting the certification to be learning behavior specialists. Um, I feel like we're going to be the cohort district. This is my, like, we're like, uh, come on up. Um, and so, you know, with CREATE and with Paraprofessional Network, and I mean, you know, I think this seems to be a great way for us to, to build the pipelines for what we need. So I don't know if you want to add anything about that process or where we are. Sure. I'm so glad to be here today. Yes, we have over 100 um, individuals within the district who've expressed an interest to attain an LBS1 certification, Learning Behavioral Specialist 1 uh, endorsement. And we are in the process of hosting our informational pretty soon. It'll be um, partnered, well, we, we will be partnered with either uh, St. Francis University or North Park. Essentially, the individuals would um, complete three courses. After the completion of the three courses, they would then um, really be on pace to achieving, achieving and receiving their LBS1 uh, certification. And um, that's pretty much yeah. it. No, I'll just share too that we're so excited about this opportunity and thank you Dr. Lockhart and um, Dr. Osher for your support in making this happen. So we'll hopefully have a decision very soon about which, which university we're partnering with and then as Dr. Lockhart mentioned, we'll um, be hopefully accepting up to 25 interested certified educators who would then be part of this cohort. So they would be able to finish all of the coursework prior to next school year, which would give us more applicants in-house to choose from and hopefully fill our open LBS slots. I, I, I just want to commend all of our staff for the incredible problem-solving skills that people are using for the staffing issues that we've had, like for us to recognize that, okay, we have people who want to do this thing but don't have the right educational background, like let's find a way to match them with that so that we can then uh, get them what they need so that they can uh, be assets in our district in, in new in, uh, new ways is, is really fantastic. And under your leadership, we've really capitalized that on a, on a lot of different fronts. So keep it up. Yep. Give a shout out to Anna Marie, who, who's in the back, who's, who really started this idea, and Thank then you. also is developing some strong partnerships with some other universities or connecting with some uh, good student teacher relationships, building a pipeline. Fantastic. You know, I, for those who don't follow education at the level that the folks in the room do, um, you know, one of the challenges in making sure that we're serving our students is that uh, education programs historically have not prioritized the needs of marginalized students and haven't made sure that every program has requirements <laughs> of uh, competency before you can graduate. So us figuring out ways to work around that and develop that uh, is fantastic. So thank you all. All right. Any other Questions on that? And I wanted to step up and oh. answer your question volunteer. about SSO <laughs> and single sign -on. Oh, and what thanks. we've done is, for the most part, we use uh, programming that allows you to be able to use your Google sign-on to be able to sign on in lieu of having to use another sign -on password. So we, we try to meld it with that when possible. And, but in some cases, it's not possible because of the platform. If the platform is unique and doesn't have the ability to be able to grab password from Google in lieu of using a new password, then we're not able to do that. So most of the uh, software that we're introducing have SSO, which allows you to use Google in place of a new password. The other thing that we're doing is we have iPassword, which was part of the MFA, multi-factor authentication. And what that does is uh, 
it allows us to essentially just have you use one password. And what it does to make sure that it's you, it verifies by sending you an email. And you get a code that you put in there, and it allows to verify that you're the person trying to log in. So we, we're doing some of that. So to wrap up, we're doing within our limits, we're doing as much as possible to implement SSO. Instead of having folks try to come up with different sign-in for different uh, sites. Great, thanks Raphael. Thank you. All right, I think that concludes our review of the curriculum report and we are ready for the equity pro progress indicators and strategic plan presentation. All right, I know this is typically the time when we say, have you, you know, if you were part of the curriculum review, um, you know, you can leave. But I think this today, to be honest, this may not be the time to leave. It's some really critical data that we all need to hear. And there may be questions that may populate for you. And if you're not in a room, you kind of get extra assignments. You know how that works. So uh, you, I, would, I would just recommend that we all stick around for the presentation today. All right. Good evening, everyone. So, good evening. I'm going to give a very brief overview for the strategic plan update, and then my colleague is going to, my colleagues from the RAD department are going to share some more um, drill down pertinent information. So, uh, thank you for this opportunity to share. I just popped in a cough drop. On our progress towards achieving our strategic goals, and also just an introduction towards a new report called the Equity Progress Indicator. So, EPI for short. A formative progress report of disaggregated data and focused areas aligned to ISB's equity journey continuum. So, what was on the agenda today? No. Okay, said that. All right, next slide, please. So, um, we're excited share with you a glimpse of this progress so far in the SY23 school year. And so if your systems think are like me, um, it feels good to be able to pull the pieces together into a more comprehensive system. As I shared earlier, we had started reality checks a while ago. Last year was our first year with the CCDs, and we were working on a strategic plan. So now to be able to have these pieces come together to kind of tell a bit of a story and then commit to do it three times a year, I think it's pretty impressive. Uh, in relation to our commitment to having our story be told and controlling that narrative. And so for that reason, I'm going to be sharing a high-level overview of three of those areas, um, keeping in mind that the department work plan, and you've heard a lot about miracles, that's where that work lives. School work plans are aligned to our six systems. You've heard me talk about reality checks and CCDs, and my colleagues, Dr. Griffin and Mr. Muhammad, are going to share um, our inaugural EPI report. So you're going to walk you through all of that. And rather than overwhelm you, I remember when I first talked about the strategic plan, we promised not to like talk over people's heads and try to really give good, clean data and stories around some of the work that we're doing. And so with that notion, um, we want to just update you and highlight a portion each time that we meet. So today's discussion from the strategic plan update is going to really focus on strategic goal two and system two. In this slide, um, this is basically an overview of our Miracles District Department project. And so these are now captured and tracked in Cascade and represent almost 81 actions associated with Strategic Goal 2. And so we're pleased to say that 87% of those actions are on track towards their respective targeted outcomes. We've got about 5% that are either behind or completed and 2% that haven't started yet. This next slide talks to us about the work products and practices that our school teams are attempting, which are aligned to System 2. And we know this because of our CCDs. These five schools highlighted here are demonstrating one-track status specific to success criteria 2.9 from our six systems. And this is in reference to the use of math data to inform instruction and academic support. These action steps describe specific things, and you heard in the spring about our priorities, 
but this is around the use of how they're using and leveraging their data for their MPSS plans, their behavior climate teams, grade level and subject PLCs, and professional learning plans. I mentioned before a little bit around our reality checks and CCBs, and these are, um, in all transparency, we experienced a couple of hiccups this year with just the seamlessness of these. But we're pleased to see that data informed practices and exemplar artifacts in real time with near perfect score of 94% uh, of our schools participated in in-person dialogue and completion of a pre-work protocol or, or deck that really described their attempt to disaggregate and really dive in and analyze their data. And then we're still in the midst of our CCBs, but of the schools that have completed, I had 15 out of 18 reporting their self-assessment, we're seeing an average score of 2.0, which is measured as growth on our six systems improvement continuum. And what that means is practices and routines are growing in these particular system categories. And then lastly, um, we're going to transition to our API reporting. And I just want to reiterate that this report reflects our commitment to monitoring our outcomes and influences that disrupt racial disproportionality of outcomes. And so we know that we're often asked about our CRB goals. That's the hot ticket of the item of discussion. And we have those displayed in our scorecards. We want to draw people's attention to our memo that lists that information, and you're going to see some more information specific to it that's disaggregated. But it's important for us to know that the scorecard is going to be a document that accompanies our strategic plan, and that's specifically to support strategic objective 2.0, I'm sorry, 2.3 and 2.4 that requires us to develop this level of analysis at least once a year. And in typical Dr. Horton fashion, we're going to do it more than once. Uh, but we also think it's equally important just to give insight into particular actions and structures from our schools and departments that are helping to contribute to and support these numbers. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to uh, Simone and Green to give you some insight on the equity progress. Hey, can I just chime in really light and quick? So there are some things that you're going to see today that you're only going to see during this first round because we are, this is a reflection of also you're going to, uh, our IAR data, which is not something that we'll report on every time. So you'll see some data. This will be a little longer than our traditional uh, design of this. But this, this November session is important that we look at IAR, how we performed last year, and some last year's data, which in, which in the same cycle from August to October 31st of last year compared to now. Um, and so just uh, bear with us as we're trying to be uh, really transparent with sharing how our school district is performing and our students and our teachers, the work that they're putting in. And we're, again, thankful for the work that they've done. Okay. As Dr. Green stated, this area falls under effective use of data for System 2 in the Miracles Framework. It really sets the story for us to be in alignment with the equity journey continuum with ISBE, and specifically making sure that when we look at our data, we make sure we disaggregate it to ensure that we look at all of the different marginalized groups to ensure that we're looking at those numbers so that we can accommodate them and address their uh, concerns and support them with interventions to move them towards student achievement. In doing so, we've looked at three things, just like the board does at, at the state level. As you can see here, when a student starts their educational journey, we must make sure that we have the right people on the team. So looking at number one, in elevating educators, we make sure that we provide a diverse population as much as possible. We look at their education, and as well as much professional learning as possible in order to ensure that they're providing culturally relevant pedagogy to all of the staff so that they can support the students that we serve, which are quite diverse. Once we have that high competent staff in place, then we look at the environment. We make sure that we are doing as much as possible to ensure those students are not being excluded from classrooms. And then once we've taken care of that culture piece, we make sure that we dive into high quality instruction, teaching and learning for our students to ensure that they meet where they need to meet on all the different assessments that are here. So that's level three for student learning. 
and looking at elevating our educators. We're excited to report that we're moving a little bit closer to a diverse population among our teachers. As you can see, we've increased diversity among our educators by about 2% among our Latinx and about 1% among our Asian demographics. And as you can see there on our education piece, we have a lot more of our staff that have master's, de master's degrees. And looking at making sure that we're providing that culturally relevant support and pedagogy for our staff. And compared to last year, for our crisis prevention trained staff, we have trained 82 more staff than last year this time. And then looking at beyond diversity trained staff, we have 106 people that have, a, have attended that training. And beyond diversity, of course, is our culturally relevant uh, professional learning session to ensure that we're looking at our cultural differences among our staff. Regarding our educators, I'm sorry, our administrators, our principals, our school leader teams, we've increased the diversity of our administrators by 7% among our black administrators and about 6% among our Latinx administrators. Now that we have our high competent staff and they're passionate about what they're doing, we take a look at that learning environment, making sure that we're not excluding students as much as possible so that they can be in the classroom to get the learning that they deserve. When looking at our suspension and referral timeline from August to October 31st of this year, you can see that we have a major decrease from 17 from last year to only one this year. When looking at our referrals, as you can see, the numbers have increased. However, they're there because our teachers have been very intentional about using restorative practices and documenting what they've done in terms of engagement in, in, in building relationship with our students. So they're documenting a lot of more of what they're doing to make sure that they get relationships with those students and address those level one, two, and three behaviors. Diving a bit more deep, as you can see across the demographics, as you can see, as I stated before, we have a lot more of the level one, twos, and threes, but this is where our teachers are chiming in and providing the supports that they need and communicating much more effectively with restorative practices and what they've learned around that culturally relevant pedagogy to support those students in those areas. And you can also see that the numbers decrease the higher the levels go regarding infractions. And taking a look at our five essentials data, as you can see here, our five essentials shows that our schools are moderately organized for improvement on average. And we know that we've got a little work to do from being in school for a full year coming off the pandemic for effective leaders and collaborating teachers. Now that the table has been set and the staff is in place, we start to look at our uh, outcomes and our assessments. MAP, of course, is our NWA. That's our assessment that we take three times a year. And our uh, phonological awareness is one of the strands that is assessed for decoding. As you can see across the three years, our students in kindergarten show a slight decrease for 3%. And looking at our, at our college readiness benchmarks data, our reading scores, although they remain stagnant in math, we're excited to show that in all grade levels, our, uh, our highest, all grade levels with the highest grade in fifth grade in math. So we're seeing some growth in our math area. Shifting from our interim benchmark assessments and going into our state level data, our Illinois assessment readiness data for reading and math, as you can see across the years, we're getting much more closely to our pre-pandemic numbers. So as you can see here, for this year, for SY22, as you can see, it's 41%, getting us close in ELA to the 44% with an only 3% uh, decrease there, but showing a major increase from last year to this year. Math as well, we're within 5% of our pre-pandemic pre-pandemic numbers as well. And although there were no science scores for 2019, as you can see, there's a 7% increase in our scores from last year to this year. Looking across our demographics, you can see here students in every group show some gains in IAR. That's again our Illinois assessment readiness there, that one time test we take in the spring. And when you look at our scores there, you can see some improvements with our black students, our Latino, Latinx students, and all the students across those demographics are showing some gains. With math, our math scores have improved across all the demographics groups there as well, moving our, our scores much closer to our 2019 pandemic numbers. As you can see with our black, we showed a little bit of an increase from nine to 10%, it's about 1% growth, but we're getting much closer to that 14% from 2019. Looking at our Latinx students, as you can see there, we went from last year 16% to 21%, getting us closer to that 25%. Our free and reduced lunch, 
from last year, 9% up to 12%. And of course, our EL students, our emergent, uh, our e in English language learner students or emerging bilingual students up 3% and then our IEP students from 7 to 11% getting us close to that 13% only within 2% to our pre-pandemic numbers. For IAR, for science, our students have shown some improvement in meeting and exceeding our performance levels there as well. Expectations in four out of five of our racial groups listed above, as you can see there. Latinx students moved from 31% to 42%, our black students from 21 to 31%, and our free and reduced lunch from 22 to 30%. So we're excited about the growth there in our science scores. Shifting from our IAR, we're going to be looking at our dynamic learning map and alternative assessment data. This test specifically tests those students that do not take the IAR. These are our students with disabilities. So as you can look across the dynamic, the demographic groups here, you can see those scores. But please be aware that with our dynamic learning map data, this is the data most of our babies would uh, fall in the emerging area. But we know that we look uh, very closely at our students' IEP. Uh, benchmark their goals to drive what we do f in supporting them in their growth, as well as look at our formative assessment data in our classrooms to make sure that we're driving from um, our kids meeting their goals. These are mostly our park students. Same here with the math scores. And then shifting from uh, the dynamic, dynamic or DLM, our dynamic learning map data for our students with disabilities over to our emerging bilingual students on access. On the access assessment, student scores only increased a little bit by 1% from last year to this year, but we're excited to see some of the strategies that we have in place for those students as well. I wanted to make one more point about the access students. We found that also with these areas, we have a lot of great plans in our multilingual department that we've been working with, driving the data for what's happening with those students, not only in these components, but those students that have tested an EL proficiency to ensure that they're growing as well. And looking at our uh, academic uh, skill center students versus those students that were eligible, we're excited to report that those students that participated in the uh, academic skill center, the tutoring program, they outperformed those students who were eligible but didn't enroll in the program in both winter and spring. There's a significant growth that you can see where those students were able to get that uh, significant uh, support in tutoring, show growth over the course of that school year. In closing, overall, our students in the district are showing improvement across the three content areas. We recognize that our foundational skills in K-2 will require some differentiated instruction, getting down into the skill levels that those students are showing some, uh, some challenges and making sure that they're getting that intervention support at each grade level, K-1 and 2. We understand also that we've got to do a little bit more regarding our emerging bilingual po population. That's why we're working with the multilingual uh, department to ensure that those uh, those interventions are provided for them. And of course, we couldn't be more excited about our ASC tutor program, providing those scores, helping those students uh, move further in that 26th to 49th percentile, those kids that are approaching in grade level on MAP. And then of course, we're excited about in terms of the environment, the learning environment in particular, the restorative practices that have been implemented have shown a significant improvement over the reduction of our out of school suspensions across our grade levels. Thank you so much. I'll take questions at this time. Do you have the document to show the differences between 2019 and 2022? Can you just yep. talk us through some highs of that? Yeah. Does the dealer have it? Well, you can talk from it. You don't have to necessarily show it. Yeah. Yeah, so speaking to Dr. Horton's point, what we did was we looked at the specific 2019 data of IAR and broke it down by subgroups. So some things we were able to see by school and by subgroup, 
in our reading for IAR, six of our schools, our overall student scores have matched or outperformed our overall student scores in 2019. And six of those schools, the white students have matched or outperformed our white student scores in 2019 as well. And five of our schools, black students have matched or outperformed our black student scores in 2019. Four of those schools, the Latinx students were able to match or outperform their scores in 2019 is as that well. ELA specifically? Yes, this is specifically ELA. ELA yep. Yes. So it's specifically ELA and specifically by that subgroup. Uh, three of our schools were able to see the free and reduced lunch student scores, matched or outperformed the student scores in 2019. And the reason why we use the 2019 because of that pre-pandemic data. So we want to make sure we looked at that. Four of our schools are emerging bilingual student scores, matched or outperformed our emerging bilingual student scores in 2019. And what was really powerful in six of our schools, our students receiving individualized education services, they were able to outperform uh, the, the students of, of receiving individual educational services in 2019. We thought that was really powerful. That was just for ELA. I can touch on the math scores as well. So in three of our schools, our overall student scores have outperformed our overall student scores in 2019, and five of them, our white student scores, have outperformed our white student scores in 2019. In three of our schools, our black student scores have matched or outperformed our black student scores in 2019, and six of our schools, our Latinx student scores, have matched or outperformed our Latinx student scores in 2019. Four of our schools, with the math, our free and reduced lunch students actually matched or outperformed our free and reduced reduced lunch student scores in 2019. Four of our schools, our emerging bilingual student scores have matched or outperformed our emerging bilingual student scores in 2019. And just like with the ELA, in math, we had six of our schools, our students receiving individualized education services were able to match or outperform their scores in 2019 as well. Thank you for sharing that, and that's critical because when we collectively look at um, our data as a district and as a community, we tend to just see the overall, but there are some phenomenal efforts that's happening in our schools led by our teachers and our school leaders. Um, I would just like to say, give, give a huge shout out to what's happening at Nichols and also Lincoln. When we look across the board uh, and you compare them to 2019 and how they have surpassed um, those marks, that is so critical to know that there was a whole pandemic that has taken taking place um, across this this world and we still have our students came back showing their resilience our teachers showed their resilience and their talents and our educators were able to organize and move that um, we may not be where um, we would like to be but we are definitely hopeful about the progress uh, and the direction that our district is going with our work so I want to just thank you all for being able to highlight and share all of that data today so thank you thank you I just want to make sure that I align the data to some of the awesome school work plans that we have seen as well as what we've heard in our reality checks and CCVs. A lot of the principals have worked just tremendously hard on making sure that with the data that they've looked at, that they've attached it to their work plans, and they've driven really, really hard around making sure they move that data from this session of our reality checks into our winter session. So now we're making sure that now that we see the data, they know that they're looking and tracking and progress monitoring over time so that when we get together in the winter session, we can see how far we've grown. So I'm really excited about what's going on with the data as well. I'm sorry, I just wanted to double back on what Dr. Horton just said as far as Nichols. In some instances, they had an over a 10% increase over 2019, so that was really good to see that work they were doing over at Nichols and ELAN and math. So our, our board colleagues have asked some pretty good questions here that I, wanted, I will try to share, but uh, Dr. Horton hasn't written for them if it's too complicated, but um, <laughs> they're, they're very intricate. So uh, from Joey, you know, we, he was asking about, you know, one of the challenges of seeing the data this way and not by grade level or in smaller cohorts has us not necessarily able to see, identify what the real growth is or the real problems may be because, right, if, it, if third grade scores and we know that they were, you know, uh, remote learning for Kinder first and second, right? Like it, it contextualizes it in a different way. So I think um, it might be helpful for us to have some either additional graphics or instead of have it have it broken down um, by grade level more significantly. 
Yeah, I had a chance to chat um, about that, and when I explained, like this is it's so critical, um, you know, with us returning to school, and if you, if you, you know, we have our joint literacy piece that we were working on, and as promised, we wanted to make sure that we highlighted and connected past data, which, uh, which is under the same assessment, which was critical, but also um, through our reality checks is that's where the bulk of that work happens when we look at the, the students that's in front of our teachers right now from one cohort to the next. Um, it's just a, a responsibility that we take on um, and we know it's serious for us to talk to every, the community about how our students are um, achieving and we know that our, our students and our educators are much more than test scores but this is a, uh, a common practice in the field uh, really updating and highlighting and again in February it will just be from um, what happened in September with, with our map to when they take it the second time it'll be that that just that populate those populations of students that they're serving right now yep and then um sula had a question about uh five e let's see so for many of the graphs and tables i'd like to have more contextual information to better interpret what we're looking at so for the five e's data are the results the summary data from all groups like staff families and students or could we get it broken down by who was who was rating, you know, because that'll get rated differently by a family than it might get rated by another educator. So having that um, more specifically would be helpful. Um, and sample sizes and percentages. Would yes, of course, we have that information for you. I have those slides as well to show you the disaggregated piece at the right. aggregate level for how we looked as a district. Great. We definitely have that we, for you. We, we get a little wonky as we try to make sure we understand what the trends and the themes are. Not a problem. Um, and then, uh, uh, did you have a question, Tracy? Oh, so then the only other question I had was, um, and this might be a Lee Stacy question, um, we're seeing some really good data about what's happening with the academic skill centers and how, what their results are on these tests. So um, at what point do we start talking about scaling that up and, and what the benchmarks are for us to determine expansion of that program? Um, uh, because, right, if we have something that's working <laughs> um, and we think, you know, that it looks like statistically it's, it's working pretty well. So, um, you know, at what, at what point do we determine to invest more heavily in that program. Oh, Donna, come on back up. <laughs> Do you want to go ahead and respond firstly? Sure. Um, yes, thank you for the interest. Um, I think the, I guess one aspect that I would say is I think we are collecting the right data in terms of working with the RAD team about identifying which students are receiving uh, the ASC tutoring um, and seeing how they're performing both within the iReady platform, which is pretty um, well tied with the map growth data and assessment that we see. So I feel in terms of student outcomes, we're looking at the right data and we're working with Dr. Griffin's team and Kareem to, you know, keep up to date on that. And then also looking at program implementation in terms of how, because it is a school leader led initiative in addition to support from us. Um, and so seeing how different school leaders are choosing to make decisions to cover students and choosing students as part of their instructional team uh, analysis of uh, data. Um, and there is some variance around that and it is affected sometimes by staffing, right? As we've talked about, you know, many times over the last, you know, year or so, so many times here, again, yeah. sorry. Um, that's a big one. <laughs> um, and then I think the third part is also doing stakeholder surveys. So from students, um, tutors, and families and caregivers. So I think, you know, we have kind of three pools of data that are giving us a, a pretty good view, both of how it's being implemented, what are the outcomes, that students are experiencing, um, and then suggestions about improvements of how we could do it. So I feel really good about that we're collecting the right things and that we're getting the right inputs, and I think we're well positioned now to think about um, what does that mean for moving forward. I, I mean, I would say you mentioned expanding, and I think I, I just maybe that's not the only way to think about it, right? It's sort of refining, um, thinking about the larger context of budget and priorities, 
thinking about where it makes most sense to focus our attention in this promising model. So I think we're looking at the right things, um, we're, I think we're collecting the right data, and we're well positioned to make good plans and bring them forward, you know, to Stacy, you know, up through Stacy for me on um, what we should do with the help of Donna and all the other, you know, collaborators, Simone and her team. Yeah, let me clarify the expansion partly is that, okay. uh, you know, we as board members don't always see interventions working um, or have clear data that says we did this thing and then this happened. And so um, whether that is expansion in terms of numbers, whether that is deepening, whether that is whatever that looks like, if this data continues, I, I would like you all to have a idea in your head of like when we hit this percentage or whatever data points, we're going to come back to the board and ask for more money. fill in the blank, whatever that, <laughs> whatever that's more money, more staff, more, um, because I, you know, I do think we want to be supporting the things that are working and, and we've seen consistent data coming out and, and maybe it's inconsistent building to building, right? That I totally hear you on like, we have to figure out what is working and where it's working and who is working, all of that. Um, but I'd encourage you all that if the data continues to look like this, that you think about how to, how we can scale it um, in the ways that could impact even more students. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we look forward to bringing that to you. Stacy, anything to add? Yeah, I, th I just want to applaud Lee's leadership here, and the cycle really is a continuous improvement cycle, and I think we should hold that we made a number of adjustments to the staffing and the model coming into this year. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to take a good look at the data as we come out, or out of our first round of interventions and go into our second round and continue to work on improvement with a lens of, you know, certainly adjustments in the moment and you know, looking forward about whatever growth or improvement looks like. So thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Keep up the good work. All right, any other questions about this presentation or? Well, again, I, know, I appreciate seeing the growth, right? And, and, and uh, there, there's no, nowhere else to go but up after the pandemic. Um, so, so that, you know, it's promising to see that, we, again, we are at or nearing 2019, um, you know, levels in regards to student outcomes. Um, again, there's a difference, right? There's growth, right? And, and I think that, you know, I appreciate the federal government uh, through ESSA having, uh, emphasized. It used to be. It used to be where we it was on, on proficiency, but now we're looking at growth, and of course our children are going to grow. Um, one of the pieces I'd like to see, uh, and we, we dig deep into, and again I see that's going to be part of our EPI, our, 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 our equity uh, uh, indicators. Equity progress indicators is again college readiness, right? And then it, this lines up to the conversation we were having a couple of weeks ago with our colleagues from 202 in, in regards to how we align all of our work uh, to ensure that children, our children are successful as they go throughout the, uh, throughout the educational continuum. So I, I just want to, again, make sure that we, you know, as we talk about the joint literacy, how we want to rethink that and look at a broader way and, and a more comprehensive way of how we measure student outcomes that, uh, again, we, 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 we continue to target, um, again, uh, uh, ensuring that students have, uh, are able to, you know, reach college proficiency uh, or, or get as close as possible and ensure that we're closing those gaps. Um, another thing I'd like to see too, um, again, and this lines up with their social emotional stuff is, is the, uh, the kids assessment, right? I know, um, so I, I'm gonna brag a little bit and, I, and so I work at the state board and I was part of the team. I wasn't the lead of the team, but part of the team that does help design the, the equity journey continuum, which is again, a, a great tool for us as community members to have a conversation about uh, how we hold ourselves accountable around equity. So what's exciting to me, and I appreciate what the team is doing, is that again, we're gonna go above and beyond just putting out a narrative, because uh, there is a narrative section that we can put out there, and we'll put that out there soon enough. Uh, but we're, all, we're putting indicators, right, uh, to really dig into and give the community details as to how are we uh, elevating educators, how, how are we uh, taking care of our student environments as well as student learning. So, so I appreciate the, the work that the team is doing in, in, in order for us to really dig in and hold ourselves accountable around the equity piece uh, that ultimately um, is going to impact outcomes um, in a positive way for our students. So, uh, but that, that's pretty much all I have. Again, I'd love to see again a little bit more of the kids data. And, and when I say kids data is again for folks who don't know, the kids assessment is an assessment that uh, again, it, it, it kind of picks up from where early childhood picks up from where it takes, you know, there's an, there are, there's assessments, uh, the teaching, uh, teaching, what's it called? The teaching standards gold. 
uh, I'm, I'm messing it up, but there's a, again a comprehensive assessment that happens in early childhood that measures, um, you know, uh, children's social, you know, mo so, uh, social emotional skills, motor skills, uh, as well as academics, and me as a big proponent of early childhood and some of those practices, um, again, uh, the, the attempt by our state is to continue that uh, comprehensive approach to um, assessing children, uh, co you know, uh, 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 holistically. So that means, again, making sure that we're not only measuring just academic outcomes, but also measuring, uh, you know, social emotional as well as, you know, their, 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 their development overall. And when we have these conversations right around, you know, we asked about er, earlier today, we asked about social emotional piece, pieces and some of the tools that we've, cre we've uh, adopted or we've purchased to help us measure social emotional pieces, right? There's a direct line to draw, uh, you know, from early childhood all the way across the continuum. So just really being uh, super, um, intentional about as we think about equity right also thinking about how we take a comprehensive approach of how we measure student outcomes and student success uh, and also making sure that you know we have families that uh, as part of that conversation and helping them understand all of this that we're talking about here today so uh, but again thank you to your team and Dr. Horn for uh, just, uh, again you're doing some phenomenal work uh, again given that we've been through a pandemic um, you know it, it's just exciting to see the, the growth that we have um, that, uh, that, that has happened uh, in spite of uh, the the um, in spite of the pandemic. Uh, but of course, we, we know there, there's still work to do uh, to make sure that our kids are, are successful in college and career. And, and again, um, I know we've got a lot of great plans for our middle schools and, you know, and, and, and again, aligning our work with 202. Uh, and that's what it's gonna take, right? It's gonna take a, a community-wide collaborative approach to ensure that our students and, and families are successful uh, and we normalize success in the school district. So thank you all. Our pleasure. Thank you all very much. All right, uh, press 109 policy updates. Uh, I move that the curriculum policy committee approve the policies and amendments viewed as part of press 109 and present them to the full board for adoption. Second. Paula Simbo? Yes. Hernandez? Yes. Lindsay Ryan? Yes. Um, I would like to alert anyone uh, who wants some light reading to check out the FYIs on the annual summer learning report and the student assignment update. There's lots of great things happening. But if there's no other business, we are going to adjourn at a no working clock uh, at 554. Get the battery.